Our Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that the story of salvation would be our theme individually. We realize, Lord, that we will be studying the science of salvation for eternity. And so if it is not rich and sweet to us here, it never will be there. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to desire, to long for, to appreciate the blood that was shed for us on Calvary, the great sacrifice that you, our Heavenly Father, made in behalf of men. I pray that you would guide us this morning, that you would bless your word by the gift of the Holy Spirit, that as we look into this parable of Jesus, the parable of the leaven, that you would help us to have rich understanding. And Father, we pray that you would give us total recall, that you might bring back to our remembrance the things that you have told us before regarding this parable. And may we just add to it as our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. I was telling the, the brethren there in the, in the office, the pastor study as we were getting ready to come out, that it feels a little bit strange uh, to stand before you. I realize it's been uh, many weeks, I guess it's been about six weeks almost now, since I've stood before you for just numerous reasons, things that have been taking place. Uh, but it's good to be back home. It's good to be before the people of God, and I just pray that you will be blessed as I was as I was studying this particular subject. And so I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew 13. Go with me to Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to verse 33. Matthew chapter 13, we're looking in verse 33, and remember we're in a series now on the parables of Jesus. And so we've gone through about five parables, and we have about 33 or so or more to go. So we'll be studying these parables for at least this year. Uh, but all of the parables are different. They're all, always a rich blessing uh, as I go through them. And so we're looking in Matthew 13. We're going to look in verse 33, and then we'll turn to our scripture reading in, in Luke 13. All right, so Matthew 13 and verse 33. And to begin this morning, when you're there, let me hear you say amen. So Matthew 13, we're looking in verse 33. The Bible says, another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leaven. So the Bible identifies that the kingdom of God, which we have studied over and over and over again together, is the kingdom of grace. And this kingdom is likened unto leaven. You'll turn to Luke 13, Luke 13, verse 20 and 21. Luke 13, 20 and 21. Now, the reason why we look at all of the different uh, gospels that these parables are recorded is because many times uh, these parables have subtle differences uh, through, say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. But this particular parable is pretty much uh, the same. It remains consistent. Uh, look with me in Luke 13, verse 20 and 21. This was our scripture reading. Uh, Christ says, again, he said, whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? The only difference here is the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven we've studied together is the kingdom of grace. It says it is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leaven. And so the Bible identifies that the kingdom of grace is like leaven. Now, we've learned the principle or purpose of leaven is to permeate anything it's placed into. So if it's put into flour, if it's put into dough, it permeates, it spreads all throughout the meal. And so the Bible is identifying that the kingdom of grace has this particular quality, that when it's placed in something, it permeates, it spreads, it fills the thing that it's placed within. And so the Bible likens the kingdom of heaven to leaven. Now leaven, we learned, and it's been many weeks, but you'll remember these things, I believe, according to God's promise. We've learned that leaven represents three things. Uh, many times in Scripture, leaven is a bad thing. It's a symbol of sin. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. All right, so again, whether it's sin, uh, sin, if it's a little sin in something, it permeates the entire thing. But we know that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of grace, cannot be likened to sin. 
And so we studied elsewhere in Scripture, and we saw that leaven represented the truth, and it represented grace itself. And so this leaven that is the kingdom of grace is a symbol of grace itself as well as doctrine, as well as truth. And the Bible says that this leaven was to be placed in the meal. And we learned that meal or the wheat was a symbol of mankind. And how when the truth of doctrine, when the grace found in the truth is placed within man, it creates an experience from the inside out that we call conversion. And so those were the things that we learned uh, last time together. That was part one on leavening all the meal. But uh, we're going to look at some different things today. Usually when we study the parables, we like to look at both the, the, the spiritual or practical aspect of the parable as well as the prophetic. And so we're going to deal with the prophetic today and how the parable of Jesus is identifying some prophetic things. Now I want to read something to you. Give me just a moment here. I want to read to you from the uh, Principles of Bible Interpretation by William Miller. And uh, we've read through these, these principles many times before. I simply want to look at three principles with you. Uh, specifically, principle number uh, six, uh, number eight, and number nine. And it will have great bearing on what we're going to study this morning. So principle number six of William Miller's Bible interpreting uh, principles or, or uh, uh, means of understanding Scripture. It says, God has revealed things to come by visions, in figures, and parables. Let me stop there. When God reveals things to come, what do we call that? Things to come. What is it? Prophecy. So it says, God has revealed things to come, or prophecy, by visions, in figures and parables. And in this way, the same things are oftentimes revealed again and again by different visions or in different figures and parables. If you wish to understand them, you must combine them all in one. Now notice principle number eight. It says figures always have a figurative meaning and are used much in prophecy to represent future things, times, and events. And so we know this already that in prophecies there are symbols there are figures and they have a figurative meaning but Miller says here that figures always have a figurative meaning and are used much in prophecy to represent future things times and events now number nine says this parables are used as comparisons to illustrate subjects and must be explained in the same way as figures by the subject in Bible now, if figures are used to understand prophecy, and parables are comparisons that should be taken in account or understood in the exact same way as figures. And God uses figures and parables to explain to us things that must shortly come to pass. One of the things we've learned about parables is that the parables of Jesus are also prophetic in nature. All right, so to understand figures, we, we trace the figure through Scripture place that in our understanding and it reveals the symbols of prophecy. Parables are the exact same. You trace the figure throughout your Bible. When you get to an understanding, you place that in the parable and then it gives you an illustration of things that must shortly come to pass. And so the parables of Jesus, though they were uh, in many times specific to the Jewish nation, uh, more importantly, they apply to us at the end of the world. And we're going to see that today by the grace of of God. So you're in Luke 13 still. You should still there, be there in your Bible. Luke chapter 13. So let's look at the parable again. Luke 13, we're going to identify three figures that we want to deal with uh, this morning. The Bible says, he said, and he, again he said, whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like what? Leaven, which a what? Woman took and hid in what? Three measures of meal. So the whole was leaven. So we've already talked about the leaven. We understand that it's doctrine. We understand that it's grace. It's truth. But we want to look at this woman. And it's the woman's role. It's the woman's job to hide the leaven in how many measures of meal? Three measures of meal. So we want to find out why three measures of meal. Who is this woman that is doing this work? 
And what does it mean here, or that she's hiding it in the meal? We've looked at meal before, but remember, some figures have more than one signification in, in the Bible. So we're going to look at these things together. So let's start with the woman, the easiest one. Go with me to Isaiah. Isaiah 54. The job of this woman in the parable of Jesus was that her role was to take the leaven and to mix it in the meal until all was leavened. Notice what your Bible says in the book of Isaiah 54. Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah, what chapter are we going to? 54. Look at verse 1 with me. The Bible says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tents, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, uh, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt, be, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. Now, naturally, uh, when you're reading through the book of Isaiah, you're wondering who is the Lord speaking to. And oftentimes in the book of Isaiah or other prophetic books or, or, or words of the prophets, these messages are specifically to the people of God, specifically to Israel. And this is no different here. God is speaking to his people and he's likening her to a woman. And I want you to notice what it says in verse 5. It says, For thy maker is thy what? Thy husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. So God is saying to his people that I am your what? Husband. Your maker is your husband. So that makes the woman the what? The wife. All right, very simple. Look at what it says in verse 6. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. And so this is the promise of the covenant of peace that he is making with his people. And he says to his people, I am your husband, therefore you are my wife. All right, stay in the book of Isaiah. Uh, go with me to Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62, notice what your Bible says. Here, God again is speaking to his church, speaking to his people. Look at what it says in Isaiah 62, verse 1. Isaiah 62, verse 1. This is a theme often repeated in the book of Isaiah. The Bible says in Isaiah 62, verse 1, For whose sake? For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until righteousness therefore goeth forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and thy, a royal diadem in the hand of the, thy, thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land be more, uh, any more termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be what? Married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy what? God rejoice over thee. And so God again is using this marriage symbol. How God is going to rejoice over his bride as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. But he's speaking to Zion. Now, who is Zion? If you stay in Isaiah and go to chapter 50, 51. Go to Isaiah 51. Who is Zion? Because Zion 
is the bride. And the bridegroom is the Lord God. So who is Zion? The Bible says in Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51, notice what your Bible says. Isaiah 51, look with me in verse 15. Isaiah 51, verse 15. And when you're there with me, amen. Isaiah 51, 15. The woman is the one that takes the meal, and she takes the leaven, and she mixes the two together. She puts the leaven. Her job is to put leaven in the meal. Who is the woman? Notice what your Bible says in Isaiah 51, verse 15. But I am the Lord thy God that divided the sea whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth, and say unto who? Zion. Remember, Zion is that bride. And say unto Zion, what? Thou art my people. And so when God is speaking to Zion, when God is saying, I'm going to marry you, He's speaking to who? His people. Notice what your Bible says in the book of Hosea. Go with me to Hosea. We're going to Hosea chapter 2. Right after the book of Daniel, you have the book of Hosea chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says. Hosea chapter 2. We're going to look together in verse 14. We'll, we'll just look in Isaiah, uh, Hosea 2, one last verse in the Old Testament. And then we'll look at two verses in the New Testament that will make this very clear who this woman is. Notice what your Bible says in Hosea 2. And let's start together in verse... Let's start in verse 14. Start with me in verse 14. Hosea chapter 2, what verse are we going to? 14. The Bible says, Therefore... Behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for the door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up out of the land of what? Out of Egypt. So God is speaking to about a woman that came out of the land of Egypt. It says, and it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi. And shall call me no more Baali or Bali, which is another name for Baal. It says, for I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth. and They shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them of the be with, for the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow, of the, bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth. And I will make them lie down safely. And I will what? Betroth thee. What's, what does that mean to betroth? To marry thee. I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindnesses and mercy, in mercies. And I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will hear, saith the Lord, and I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that hath not obtained mercy. And I will say unto them which are not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my what? God. And so here is the Lord speaking to his people. But he's again likening this covenant that he's entering in with them to being betrothed or to being married. And so God is the husband and the people, the church, are the what? The bride. Go with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul understood this principle very clear. For when he was speaking to the church in Corinth, notice what he says to the church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And you're going to look with me in verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians eleven two, 2, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to what? One husband. 
that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul is speaking to the church, saying, I have given you, I have espoused you to one husband, that you may be a chaste virgin, a, a faithful bride to Christ. Again, Christ being the husband. Now, finally, he follows this same uh, uh, principle in the book of Ephesians, a, 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 a chapter that we're very familiar with when it comes to this particular symbol. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 and verse 22. Ephesians chapter 5. Look with me in verse 22. Who is this woman? This woman's role, this woman's job is to take the leaven and to put it in the three measures of meal. Christ was very specific. He did not say this woman's job is to take the leaven and put it in the meal. He said three measures of meal. He was very specific. Not one, not two, not four, but three. Who was this woman? Notice what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Ephesians 5 and verse 22. The Bible says, wives, what is that next word? I want to make sure you're there with me. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the what? Church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in what? In everything. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be what? One flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the what? The church. So friends, who is the woman? It's the church. And when Christ is teaching the parable, the role of the church is to take the leaven and put it where? In the three measures of meal. Now, what was the leaven? Remember, the leaven is truth and grace. The job of the church is to put truth and grace in the three measures of meal. Now, we've learned some things weeks ago now. But I want to read a statement to you that might summarize some of that which we have learned before. Let me read something to you. This is from Acts of the Apostles, uh, page 9. Acts of the Apostles, page 9. Now, this woman takes the leaven, the truth and the grace, and she hides it in the meal. And we've learned one of the things the meal symbolized was mankind. In other words, the role of the church is to take truth and grace and put it and place it in people. Now, you might say, no, that's not our job. That's not my job. No, that is your job. The very reason you have been called by name, the very reason you have been added unto the church of Christ is to take grace and truth and place it in men. And if we are not doing that work, you are not the woman. The woman's role is to take truth and grace and place it in mankind. Notice this in the book of Acts of the Apostles, page 9. Acts of the Apostles, page 9, it says, The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. What is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men? It did not say angels. It did not say the Holy Spirit. It said the church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It is the woman's role to put truth and grace in men. Notice what it says. 
It, the church, was organized for service. And its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plan that through his church shall be reflected to the world his fullness and his sufficiency. The members of the church, those whom he has called out of darkness into his marvelous light, are to show forth his glory. The church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ. And through the church will eventually be made manifest even to the principalities and powers in heavenly places the final and full display of the love of God. The church is God's fortress. I'm skipping down to uh, page 11. The church is God's fortress, his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. Any betrayal of the church is treachery to him who has bought mankind with the blood of his only begotten son. Who is the church? What is the church? From the beginning, faithful souls have constituted the church on earth. In every age, the Lord has had his watchmen who have borne a faithful testimony to the generation in which they lived. These sentinels gave the meshes of warning, and when they were called to lay off their armor, others took up the work. God brought these witnesses into covenant relation with himself, uniting the church on earth with the church in heaven. He has set forth his angels to minister to his church, and the gates of hell have not been able to prevail against his people. Again, that's Acts of the Apostles, page 9, and also page 11. And so the woman is a symbol of the church, and the woman's role was to take the leaven, grace and truth, and place it in the meal, a symbol of mankind, the world. Our job is the salvation of souls. The very reason we are here is to work for souls. You know, there was something I believe it was said, uh, I believe it was last Sabbath, if I'm not mistaken. That's when Pastor Knight preached, right? Last Sabbath. And last Sabbath, or maybe it was, no, excuse me, it was when we were in uh, Porterville together and we were dealing with the question, what is the church? Is self-supporting ministry, uh, 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 independent churches, are they considered Seventh-day Adventist churches? Are they the church of God? Or is it merely the organized, structured conference churches that are the church of God? And we were answering this from the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy. And one of the things that he said was that, you know, oftentimes the church is considered a hospital. You ever heard that before? How people consider the church a hospital and how people come to church uh, individuals come to church to try to be made well. Now, whereas in one sense, that is, that is true. God can allow people to come and they can be healed by the grace and truth that comes through the church. But friends, we need to understand something. Though we might have issues in our life that need healing, if we are a part of God's church, we are not sick in a hospital. We are soldiers. And what good is an army if everyone is in the infirmary? If everyone's in the infirmary, who fights the battle? And so, friends, if we're a church, our role is not just to be filled, but to fill. We are not just to come to receive a blessing, but to be a blessing. And in order for us to be a blessing, we also have to be blessed. Right? Abraham was blessed so that he can bless the world. We too must be blessed so that we can be a blessing. Now, something was very interesting about this particular parable. I want to go back there with you to Luke chapter 13. I just want to look at the language there with you again. It's a very short parable, so we might refer to this particular uh, chapter and verses over and over again this morning. But notice what it says in Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. And we want to look at verse 20 and 21. Because when I read this parable, something, something struck me. It reminded me of something. It says in Luke 13, look at verse 20 again with me. It says, and he said, and again he said, whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like what? Leaven which a woman took and hid in what? Three measures of meal to the whole was leaven. Now when I read this, a story popped into my mind about a woman who also took three measures of meal. And with that meal, she made bread. 
And so I want to look at this particular story with you. Notice what it says in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 18. Because the woman of the parable is also symbol, sim, a symbol of the woman of this literal story in history. So notice what it says in Genesis 18. Genesis, what chapter are we going to? 18. Look at Genesis 18 with me. Genesis 18. Now we're looking together in verse 1. Genesis 18, we're looking together in verse 1. When you're there with me, amen. The Bible says, And the Lord appeared unto him, this is speaking of Abram, Abraham. It says, The Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat at the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, how many men? Three men stood by him. When he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto who? Unto Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly what? Three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. Now notice, Sarah, this woman, was told to take how many measures of meal? Three measures of meal. What was she supposed to do with it? She was to knead it. And when you're kneading bread and you're getting ready to place it on the hearth, you want to mix a little something in it so, it so it rises, and that would be leaven. So as she's taking the three measures of meal and she's mixing it in the, le in the leaven in it, and she's making this bread. So in the parable that Jesus teaches about a woman taking leaven, placing it in three measures of meal, that woman is perfectly represented by who? By Sarah. But who is Sarah? Go with me in the New Testament now. Of First Peter. Notice what your Bible says in First Peter chapter 3. Who is Sarah, friends? Who is this woman? Yes, it's the church, but let's be specific. Notice First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. Whoever this woman is, whoever this church is, they have the characteristics of Sarah. Now, who is Sarah? What is her character? Notice what your Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3. We're looking together in verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 1, it says, Likewise ye wives, be in what? Subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting of the hair, of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, what type of women? The holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as who? Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. And so notice the biblical characteristic now of Sarah. Was Sarah uh, uh, against or was Sarah uh, uh, not in subjection to her husband? No, Sarah was in subjection to her husband. The Bible calls her a holy woman. The Bible shows that she reverenced her husband. Now, friends, listen. If we are the church and we are represented by the woman, who are we to be in subjection to? Christ. Who is Christ then? The husband. We are to be in subjection to our husband. But then you can gather even some very uh, physical principles. How was these women described? Whether it was their outward adornment? Did they, they put on their trinkets? Did they, they, they draw attention to themselves? No, they had a meek and quiet spirit. And so their dress 
their, 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 their lifestyle, their attitude, their subjection is the symbol of Sarah. Sarah is the woman that took the three measures of meal and placed the leaven in it. That is the church. And if we do not fit the bill, then we're not the woman. You might be in a church, but you might not be the church. That makes a whole lot of difference. Are you the church or are you in church? Where is your mind at? Am I... Am I a member of the body of Christ or do I just hang around? Am I here to be a blessing or am I just here to get like Ananias and Sapphira? Just want to receive and not to impart. Who am I? The Bible says the woman symbols Sarah. And Sarah was a holy woman in subjection to her husband. Another, another story just pops into my mind. Go with me to uh, 1 Kings. First Kings, I believe. Go with me to First Kings. Yes, First Kings 17. Look at this here. Woman and meal. Uh, these, these things bring different stories to my, to my mind. Look at First Kings 17. First Kings 17. We're going to start together in First Kings 17. Go with me to verse 8. First Kings 17 and verse 8. And so the Bible shows this is the story of Elijah. And Elijah, remember, there was uh, no dew or rain during the time of three and a half years until he gave word. And while he was, there was no rain, he hid by the brook Cherished. And the Lord fed him there uh, in the morning and the evening by ravens. You remember the story, right? But then the brook dried up and he needed water. And so God told him to go to Zarephath. And notice this story. There's beautiful things here. Look at, look at verse 8 with me in 1 Kings 17. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a what? A widowed woman there to sustain thee. Now notice, in this particular story, this woman. We're going to key in on the, some principles of this woman. It says, so he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called unto her and said, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it, and then what? Die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. Now maybe Elijah didn't hear correctly. Maybe Elijah was so focused on the fact that he was hungry and thirsty that he didn't listen that the woman said, listen, I don't have another cake. I have just a little meal. I'm going to make it for me and my son. And after we eat that, we're going to die because that's it. But here Elijah comes. And who was Elijah? What was Elijah? Let me ask you that. Elijah was a prophet. And here Elijah comes, here's the spirit of prophecy speaking to this woman. And the spirit of prophecy speaks to this woman and says, okay, you can go and do what you said, but first, before you make yourself food, go and make me some food. Take care of me first, and then make some for your son and for yourself. Now notice what the woman says. Notice what she does. Verse 14 says, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the, cur the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat, how long? Many days. Now think of it though. How many people are being fed here? Elijah, the woman, and her house. But who was in her house? Her son. So how many little measures of meal did she find? She would always find, there would be three. Every time she would go to make bread, it was always three measures of meal. And the woman would go and knead it and she would place the leaven in it and bake bread and feed 
the three. The Bible says, and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. And it came to pass, it says, after these things, that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up unto a loft, where he abode and laid, upon him his own, and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, it says, Hast thou also brought evil upon the, the, the widow whom I, with, with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child, how many times? Three times, and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come in unto him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came in into him again, and he what? Revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See thy son liveth. And the woman said unto Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that thou the word of the Lord in thy mouth is what? The truth. Now, when we look at this particular story, there's many different things we can pull out. I just want to pull out uh, just a few, maybe just two. This woman, again, we're going to liken unto the church. And the woman, what does she do? Does she obey Elijah? And who was Elijah? The prophet. So here is the woman. She obeys the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy tells her to do something. She does not question. She does it. And because she obeyed the spirit of prophecy, it saved her and her household. And even though her child died, because of her obedience, God was able to revive her dead child. Friends, listen to me, parents specifically. We might have children that can be dead in trespasses and sin. But if we are obedient to the Lord, God will answer our prayers. But if we are disobedient, what would have happened? What would have happened to the woman if she said, look, man, you're crazy. Go on and kick rocks. I'm going to go ahead and eat this bread myself, me and my son. What would have happened to her? You see, if she did not obey the spirit of prophecy, she not only would have died, her son would have died. If she did not obey the spirit of prophecy, God would not have heard her prayer if she was not obedient unto the Lord. No matter what she would have said for her son would have mattered none. And so, friends, the woman is the church. The church's role is to take the leaven, the truth and grace, hide it in the meal. The church is likened unto Sarah in subjection to her husband or in subjection to Christ, not having outward adornment having a lifestyle that's pure and chaste, a chaste virgin, like Paul says. But the church is also likened unto this widowed woman who obeys the spirit of prophecy and as a result can pray for her children and God will answer her prayers. Friends, there's many beautiful things, many, many beautiful things that can be gathered out of these stories. The Bible tells us back in the book of Luke 13, you don't have to turn there. We've, we've read it many times. But in Luke 13, this woman, she takes these three, or I should say she takes the 11 and hides it into how many measures? Three measures of meal. Now, we'll deal with the three measures at the end. But let's talk about the meal because there's the meal, although it represents mankind as we saw before, but it also represents something else. And so in our story that we read about uh, Abraham and about Elijah, both of those women took three measures of meal. And that meal, what did they make out of that meal? Bread. So the meal and the bread are synonymous. They go together. And so the meal is a symbol of bread. Now what is bread? The bread of life. You can turn to John chapter 6 now. Go there with me, John chapter 6. John, go with me to chapter 6. We're going to John chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 48 together. Remember when Jesus was being tempted. 
And he was tempted to turn the stones into bread. He quoted the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3 and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God shall man live. And so the bread is a symbol of God's word or the message. Notice what it says in the book of John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We know what the woman represents. We've seen what the leaven represents. Let's look at this meal a second time. Look at John chapter 6. We're looking together in verse 48. John chapter 6, verse 48. The Bible says, I, Christ is speaking, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are what? Dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. And with your sanctified imagination, you can almost see that Christ pointing to himself. This is the bread that comes down from heaven that if a man eat, he will not die. It says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews didn't understand this. They said, how can he give his flesh to eat? And Jesus says to them, verse 53, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat, and drink, meat indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall what? Shall live forever. And Then he describes what it represents, verse 30, uh, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The what? words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are what? Life. So when Christ was saying, eat of this bread, eat of my flesh, my flesh is the bread. And the Jews were like, how can he give us his flesh to eat? And he says, listen, man, the flesh, physically it profits nothing. The words I speak unto you, their spirit and their life. In other words, the bread is a symbol of the word. Do you remember Jeremiah in Jeremiah 15? In Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse uh, 16. Jeremiah 15, 16, I believe. I'm correct on the verse. Yes, Jeremiah 15, 16, where he says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3 was also told to take and eat the word. John in Revelation chapter 10 was also told to take and eat the word. And so this word or this bread, the message, the church's job, listen now, the woman's job is to take the leaven, grace, and place it in the meal. Yes, it's a symbol of mankind, but it's also the message. The job of the church is to put grace where? In the meal, the bread, the word, the message. This is the job of the church. If the message is graceless, then there's no life in it. The message must contain grace so that there can be life to those who eat the word of God. Back in the book of Luke, it told us that it was three measures of meal. How many measures? Three. Um, go with me to Genesis again. Let's do it this way. Genesis chapter 18 again. Genesis chapter 18. So we bring out some final, final thoughts here. Genesis 18. I want to start in verse 1 afresh. Genesis 18, verse 1. So here's the woman again. Remember Sarah. And she is taking three measures of meal. The same wording that Christ uses for his parable. 
And now we want to look at what these three measures of meal, why three measures? Notice what your Bible says. Genesis 18, we're going to start in verse 1. When you're there with me, amen. Before we get into this, is there any, anyone out there that might have an, an idea why God uses three measures of meal? Why three? Not difficult. Think of it now. The church, the woman, she is to take leaven, which is grace, and place it in the message, which is the meal. And the message comes in three measures. What is this? The first, the second, and the third angel. That's our work. That's our message. But if we give that message without grace, there's no life in it. And so, friends, we can be giving the message. You have people saying all the time they give it the three angels and they preach the three angels, but it's graceless. And as a result, it doesn't rise. It doesn't create an influence. You know, we're told when the third angel is preached as it should be, power attends its proclamation and it becomes an abiding influence. That's a direct quotation from the spirit of prophecy. And so it has to be preached in a certain manner. We're not talking about how a man delivers the message, but what's in it. There must be grace. We must talk about Jesus. We must uplift the cross. We must talk about overcoming sin. We must talk about righteousness. That is not sentimentalism. It is the power in the messages. And friends, if we don't have that, if we don't put it in, We'll never be able to experience it in the life. And so the role of the church, and notice, we're not saying the role of the minister, though the minister preaches, but it's the role of the church, the woman, to put leaven in the meal, in the three measures of meal. And so let's look at this three measures in Genesis 18. I want to show you that the three measures of meal are tied in with angels. As a matter of fact, exactly the first, second, and third angel. We'll see this very clear. Look at Genesis 18. Go back into this story. It says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent, uh, in the tent, in the door, in the heat of the day. So this is Abraham again. He's sitting there. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, how many men? Three men stood by him. Now, I, re I want you to remember how many men? Three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself towards the ground and said what? My Lord. Now, you have to understand, you might be reading this thinking that Abraham recognized these individuals as just some regular travelers. And so he, because of the Eastern culture, he, he would invite them in and wash their feet and feed them and address them reverently. But no, Abraham recognizes who this is. When he came and says, O oh Lord, all right, this is O oh my Lord, not little L, but capital L. So what Abraham realizes is this is Jehovah. This is the one who has come to meet me. But there is Jehovah and how many others? Two. Notice what it says. It says, he said, my Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts that after ye, ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened to the tent unto Sarah and, 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 and said, make ready quickly. How many measures? Three measures of fine meal needed and make cakes upon the hearth. Why did she need to do it with three measures? Because she's feeding what? Three individuals, these three angels. Notice what it says in verse 9. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, and that, uh, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxen old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Now it's very interesting there. 
because he says this twice. He says, listen, Sarah's going to have a child, and I'm going to return unto you at the time of what? The time of life. If you read on, when Sarah conceived at the point of conception, the Lord appears unto her. So when is the time of life? When a baby comes out of the womb or the point of conception? Oh, so that clears away the argument. None of God's people should be aborting babies then. Because the time of life is conception. You just read that in the Bible. And that's why it is a breaking of the commandments of God for the church of God to be involved in offering abortions to women. We claim to be upholding the commandments, yet we break the very one that says, Thou shalt not kill. And if we break one, we, what, we do what? We break them all. And so friends, you might say, oh, wait a minute, you're taking away women's rights. What about the right to life? What about that right? What about the right to allow God to bring another soul into the world that he can save in his everlasting kingdom? How many have not had that opportunity? Untold millions of children. The Bible says in verse 15, then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. And the, and the men rose up from thence, verse 16, and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is gr very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet with who? The Lord. So I want you to notice what's happening here. How many men come to meet Abraham? Three. One of them very clearly is identified as the Lord. And what does the Lord do? What is he doing here? What message does the Lord bring to Abraham? What was the message that God brought to Abraham? What was the message? It's twofold. I want you to look at Genesis 21. Stay there. Stay in uh, Genesis 18. Put your Bible ribbon or, or a piece of paper, but mark your place. Go with me to Genesis 21. Genesis 21. Remember, one of the first things that he says to Abraham is that your wife is going to bear a what? Bear a son. And who was the son of Abraham's old age that's being spoken of here? Isaac. Isaac. Notice what it says in, in, in Genesis 21. Genesis 21, we're just going to look at one verse. Look with me in verse 12. The Bible says, And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. Remember, Abraham tried to take matters in his own hands and lay with Hagar and brought forth Ishmael. And he wanted Ishmael to be the son of promise. And God was like, No, no. Uh, this is what he's referring to. He said, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in who? For in Isaac shall thy what? Seed be called. Now I want you to notice something. In all of the promises, you look at all of the promises to Abraham. It never says seeds. Never said seeds. It was not referring to anything plural. Some might say, oh, well, seed can refer to any of your offspring. No, not according to Paul. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament book of Galatians, notice what it says in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. The promise that was given to Abraham that through his seed all the world would be blessed was not referring to the physical son Isaac, but who Isaac symbolized. Notice what it says here in Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3. Look at verse 16 with me. 
Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Here is the first angel, the Lord himself. He comes and he gives a message. And what was this message? Look at what it says in verse 16. Galatians 3, what verse? Verse 16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is who? Christ. So the message to Abraham was really regarding the birth of who? Christ. And isn't that part of the everlasting gospel? So here is the first angel who is Christ himself. And when you even study it in Revelation chapter 10, and it talks about that mighty angel that's standing upon the scene upon the earth, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow upon his head and his face shining as it was the sun. And the Bible identifies that he has a message that he's giving with a loud voice to the entire world. And he points them to the hour of God's judgment when he says, time shall be no longer. Right? That's the symbol of the first angel's message. But that first angel, we're told, Sister White says that it's no less a personage than that of Jesus Christ. And that's 7 Bible Commentary, page 971. And so the Lord here, Christ, he comes to Abraham and he gives the message of the everlasting gospel. And we quote the first, second, and third angel's message every Sabbath. And so when Christ is giving the message that he is to have a son, and that son is a symbol of Christ, he's giving the everlasting gospel. But what else does the first angel talk about? The hour of what? God's judgment has come. Isn't that what he next told Abraham? If you go back with me to Genesis chapter 19, go back there. Genesis, excuse me, chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Notice what it says in verse 17. We'll start in verse 16 for context. So after he tells him about Christ who is to be born, the everlasting gospel, it says in the men in verse, verse 16, the men rose up from thence and looked towards where? So Sodom. Who was the men that it's being spoken of here? Who were the men? These are the, the angels, right, that came and met Abraham. And we'll see that it's angels. The Bible says, And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? And what was he talking about doing? Destroying Sodom. All right? So he first comes to Abraham and tells him of the everlasting gospel. Then he tells to Abraham the hour of his judgment has come specifically upon Sodom. So this is the very message of the first angel. But then the Bible says, look in chapter 19. Look at verse 1. Chapter 19, verse 1. The Bible says, and there came what? Two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot seeing them rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. So the first angel, which was the Lord, gives the message of the everlasting gospel about Jesus Christ, tells about the hour of judgment that was coming. And then you have these two other angels. What are the messages of these angels? Look at with me, verse 12. Verse 12. And specifically remember, this is tied together with those three measures of meal that was made for these angels. The three measures of meal having an allusion to the message of the first, second, and third angel of which we've identified. But I want to show you these three angels here in the story. The Bible says in verse 12, And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides thy son-in-law, thy sons, thy daughters, and whosoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place? For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his son-in-law, which uh, married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his son-in-law. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful unto him, and brought him forth, and set him without the city. What do we see here with these two angels? They come into Sodom, and don't they say that, the, that Sodom was fallen now? That the iniquity of Sodom was great, and Sodom has fallen? 
and now to come out of her, my people. Wasn't that the message they were giving to Lot? Go and get your family and call them out. Why? So that you're not a partaker of their iniquity? So that you do not receive of their judgment? What messages were those? The message of both the second and the third angel. And so in the story of Lot, in the story of Genesis 18 and 19, you see the first, second, and third angel. You see the woman making the three measures of meal. You see all the symbolism there. And so, friends, listen, the job of the church is to take grace and put it in the three measures of meal. That is our job. That is the work that God has given us to do. I want to close with you. I want to close with you in just one statement. Just one statement. To show you that the woman must put grace in the messages until the messages are full of grace. Notice what it says. This is home missionary. The home missionary. This is a periodical. The home missionary, November 1st, 1893. The home missionary, H.M., November 1st, 1893. This is Article A, paragraphs 10 and 11. Notice what it says. The message we have to bear is not a message that men need cringe to declare. They are not to seek to cover it, to conceal its origin and purpose. Its advocates must be men who will not hold their peace day nor night, as those who have made solemn vows to God and who have been commissioned as the messengers of Christ, as stewards of the mysteries of the grace of God, we are under obligation to declare faithfully the whole counsel of God. We are not to make less prominent the special truths that have separated us from the world and made us what we are, for they are fraught with eternal interests. God has given us light in regard to the things that are now taking place in the last remnant of time. And with pen and voice, we are to proclaim the truth to a world, not in a tame, spiritless way, but in demonstration of the spirit and power of God. But it is the life of Jesus Christ in the soul. It is the active principle of love imparted by the Holy Spirit that alone will make the soul fruitful unto good works. I want to back up now. When she's talking about the message that we've been given, the message that we are not to cringe to give, the message that has made us as a people what we are, the message that has separated us from the world and brought us into his marvelous light, what message is this? What message is this? Three angels' messages. Or you can say the third angel because you can't have a third without the first and second. Those are the messages. That's the message. But it says this, but it is the life of Jesus Christ in the soul. It is the active principle of love imparted by the Holy Spirit that alone will make the soul fruitful unto good works. The love of Christ is the force and power of every message for God that ever fell from human lips. Yes, we've been given the first, second, and third. We've been given these things. We shouldn't cringe when we give the message about Babylon's fall and the smoke of torment ascending up forever and ever and the mark of the beast and the plagues and, and the hour of God's judgment. Those are not messages that cause us to cringe because rightly understood, these are the greatest messages of grace that have ever been given to mortal man. And we're told it is the love of Christ. The love of Christ is the force and power of every message for God that ever fell from human lips. So when Christ is teaching the parable, and he's saying the woman, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of grace is like unto a woman that took leaven and hid it, and that word hid there in the original means to mix with all. In other words, she put the leaven in all the meal till the whole was leavened. That parable teaches you and I that we, the church, the woman, are to take the grace of God, place it within the three measures of meal, a symbol of the message of the first, second, and third angel. We are to mix it in so thoroughly that the whole is leavened. Because, friends, it is that message 
that is going to separate a people out of the world. And if we do not put the grace where the grace is due, if we don't put the grace where the grace belongs, the message is flat. The message won't rise. The message does not give off that, that permeating influence. We the people are the ones that are take that message of grace and place it in the meal. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, God is giving us our work. And our work is not to come to church and listen to a sermon. That is not our job. You do not feel, fulfill Sabbath duties when you just come and listen. Our job is to take the grace. Our job is to take the truths and to impart them to others. Our job is to take the work that God is doing in our lives, place that wonderful work of grace in the truth and give it to the world. That is our job. And if a church does not do that work, it is not the church of the parable. There's only two churches in all of the Bible. There's the true church, and there's the harlot woman. And I heard Elder this morning as he was going over the Sabbath school lesson, and he was talking about the messages, the three messages, and how we are to give them. And he was showing that there is a counterfeit message and it's very interesting, the counterfeit message comes in the form of three as well. Those three frogs that come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Dare I say that the messages of the first, second, and third angel can be turned into satanic entities if grace is not mixed within? Dare I say, like the prophet of God in the book Desire of Ages, that if the truth does not make us kind and sincere, and loving and heavenly minded that it the truth has become a curse unto us and by our influence it becomes a curse to the world can we the church take the truth of God and turn it into a curse yes indeed if grace is not mixed with him friends God wants us to not only be partakers of grace but dispensers of grace in the truths that he has given us as a people. Father, please be with us as your children. Please, dear Father, help us to be willing to share the gospel. Help us, dear Father, to love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. Help us, dear Father, to take the truths that took place on Calvary Help us to take the truths that took place when Christ resurrected and ascended up on high and sat at the right hand of you. Help us to take the truths that we find when Christ is in the holy place and most holy place, ministering in behalf of men, his blood. Help us to take that grace and mix it in the messages that we might attract men and that grace might fill their souls and save their souls. Help us as your people, dear Father, to do the work that the woman is to do. And forgive us, dear Lord, for not doing to our fullest capacity this great work. Inspire us individually. Inspire us, dear Father, as family units. Inspire us as a church as a whole to share the grace of Christ with those who are in the world. Be with us and keep us today. And may our speech be always seasoned with grace and salt. May our speech be in heaven as we fellowship one with another. In Jesus' name we pray.